Hey guys, how are we doing? Uh, this is Craig here from uh, Bass Lessons Melbourne. Today for a player profile um, video, um, I'm joined by Carl Rashid Abel. So, that's Craig. Yeah, good to meet you, man. Thanks for coming around. No problem, man. Um, you're in town with Laura Mvula. Yeah. You said that correctly as well, man. Yeah. Impressive. I've, I've been practicing. <laughs> Wicked, man. Yeah, so you guys were playing the recital centre last yeah, night. Yeah, how, yeah. how did it go? It was amazing. Sold out crowd. <clears throat> She captured everybody. Yeah, everybody's listening. Everybody list, like was taking her music seriously, and which she absolutely loves. And uh, and it's also just good to uh, I don't know, be in a different country, halfway across the world, and people be so receptive to yeah. to that kind of music as well because it's very like um, different yeah. and stuff like that, and have it to be respected loved and people for everybody to join in at the end and have a good old dance and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was a great show. So you, you sound great, man. Thank you very much, man. Um, yeah. So how, how long have you been um, playing playing with Laura for? I've been playing with Laura for around four or five years. Yeah. This first show that we ever did was actually at the iTunes Festival, support Rebecca Ferguson. And then four years later, down the line, we're in Melbourne playing to a sold out audience. Yeah. But she's worked incredibly hard though, like yeah. non-stop for the past like four years, doing loads of different things. And she's keep she's kept true to herself, which is like a great thing for any artist. Mm. And it's kind of inspiring for me as well, to be honest, to see that kind of integrity and um, this hunkering down. Work and, ethic. Yeah, work ethic. And this like this having that kind of focus as well. I mean, it can be detrimental at certain times, but it can also be like um, this incredibly successful but yeah, knowing yeah. What, what you want out of the whole situation and stuff like that yeah know, working it out as you go along as well and has it kind of been the same the same band the same group of guys yeah it has actually that's, I, that's pretty awesome yeah it's amazing. in fact not even the same group of guys it's been the same crew the wow. same crew so she's had the same like sound engineer from the from the get-go kind of uh same same drummer, same bass player. She's had a family in, in the band from the get go as well. So brother on brother on the cello and, uh, and so the the guitarist you saw yesterday actually is like a phenomenal singer and also a really good violin player. Like her violin playing is you 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 wouldn't you wouldn't believe when you heard when you see her play violin you'd be like oh what the hell. So but then she just started playing guitar and she's got really good at that really quickly as well. She's one of those people. Yeah, she's incredibly talented and she, she's, she's her own songwriter as well. She's in the process of writing songs and learning how to do that and becoming probably very good at that as well, you know. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's good to be around such a bunch of talented people, to be honest, and yeah. the brothers incredibly like, very focused individuals, same with Troy. And the new addition is uh, the piano player, Oliver Rockwell. Oli yeah, yeah. You know, from the Janet, is it, I think, who did you see him last Oh, time? it was so, with Yannick. Yeah, Yannick. Yannick, so, Yannick yeah. Yeah. yeah, he he was all over that kind of synth, yeah, man. Pad stuff. I think that's in fact that's that was. It's been a learning curve. When you get, when this gig you or on the Laura gig in general, you learn. You have to learn quite a lot, just in terms because on the first album everybody had to sing as well, and I've never sang before, so it was a learning curve for me learning yeah. how to sing. And with Ollie, he's just, this is the first time he's using like uh, kind of this kind of uh, the day Dave Smith Prophet to yeah. Pro Tune. He's getting used to using the different sounds, the cut off points, and all that kind of stuff. So it's all, it's very different from what I used to do anyway, you know. Well, for, my, for myself in terms of being coming from a jazz background. Right. And then go to this kind of pop stuff. But it's not pop, pop, pop. No. It's like, you know, yeah. slightly esoteric and interesting and like, you know. Yeah, and like what, like watching the gig last night, I was thinking, it's it's not a pop gig, but it has the pop um, vibe, I guess, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, love songs or breakup songs mm -hmm. or, you know, songs about, you know, those kinds of themes, mm -hmm. but it's delivered in, in a, in a really kind of mature way. Like mm -hmm. it's quite rhythmically and harmonically dense. Mm -hmm. you know, oh yeah. Like some of those, I don't know if they're kind of African roots or, mm -hmm. or what, but some of those kind of overlapping 
you know, motifs and stuff is like that's that's kind of what separates it from from mm -hmm. the pop thing. I guess mm -hmm. I guess you could sit there and, and do an acoustic guitar and she could sing over the top and mm -hmm. it sound more like a typical pop song. But when you guys play it in that way with that arrangement and stuff like that, it takes it to a totally different place. Like how how did you find um, like playing that kind of material where it's it's not quite so predictable? I guess. The weird thing is, is that from the, from the beginning, she she had the mindset of it being a pop gig. So everybody had the mindset of it being a pop gig. So it was very tight. Then she started hanging out with jazz musicians. <laughs> and she's always been a bit of a jazz head at heart. The so corruptors. Things, yeah, so things have become become slightly <clears throat> more expanded and grown and grown and grown. And things have... I've taken quite a lot of liberties here and there. And yeah. I've had to be reined in here and there. <laughs> everybody's... Yeah, everybody's kind of pushing the boat out a little bit and stuff like that. But, but she, she kind of wants that to happen. She wants that to happen. And because it, it, she gets a little bit bored after a while. She wants things to go for like... For example, the way we play She was completely different than the way it's on the album or we've mm. ever played it before. And then she's listened, she became a massive fan of like Fella um, over the past two years. Fella so, Kuti? Yeah, Fella Kuti. Okay. And so she's been in, like bringing that in. And yeah, the, the, the arrangements from the, uh, like the way we play Green Garden, that's a completely Afrobeat mm. kind of vibe. It's completely different from the, from the album version right. and stuff like that. So she's, so that, that's her kind of thing at the moment, exploring that kind of territory and stuff like that. So, but she wants it to be, like a like the form in, the forms are quite like you know yeah very songwriter based even like you have your your verse your chorus your verse yeah. bridge blah 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 very strong forms but then you expand from that yeah, quite the, a I lot. Yeah, there wasn't there's no solos there was no oh like, no no you know no or a guitar solo I was like you know I just I just popped in my head yeah, like, yeah. actually there was no you could you know because you've got those kind of repeating kind of cycles there could be a, a solo opportunity but has that been tried and can um, kind of thing or just not really part of the idiom. Yeah, had, there was one part when there used to be another piano and he used to play trumpet there when he used to have a, like a little solo, but not really. There isn't like, like solo. It's almost a bit like um, everybody's solos, at this, but everybody's not soloing. A bit like a weather report thing because you have to swarm in the song. Sure. And I'm I'm improvising, so I have like a set kind of bass line, yeah. whatever it is, and like a there's, there's, there's a tune called like, Let Me Fall. Um, mm, mm, mm. But then from that, I will start improvising around it. Okay. But she will allow me to do that because it will. But it's, I, it's still within yeah, the groove. It's still though. within the groove, you know. Yeah. So so every, and then Ollie will do something, something here. Uh, the old. <laughs> She'll just do something different slightly, cool. the, uh, and the brothers on the shakers now, so you might add a little something, something. Okay. So it's like, it, it's still like a pop thing, but it breathes a lot more, I think. And that needs to have, I'll enjoy, I personally enjoy that yeah, in a yeah. lot of music. Yeah. Where it's, you know where everything is, but you, you have a little bits of people's individual individuality coming through a little bit and stuff like that. And when like you've that. got the right guys in the band, oh, that's yeah. when it creates something unique uh, and... Unique Special. and also guys have been in the band from the beginning, so you know how everybody works together. Mm. So that's you get those kind of beautiful moments, you know. Yeah, but you guys are running tracks though as well. Yes. So that's why the forms, I guess, are yeah, 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 yeah. But there, there are other forms like um like we did Flying Without You with no track or anything like that, or like Sing to the Moon with no track. But she still wants, you know, she, she's still a songwriter at heart. Sure. But she's got this jazz kind of element inside That's of where cool. she wants to break things apart a little bit stuff like yeah. that so it's good to be and I've always played with people like that though who have like pretty, pretty focused down the line but they still have this kind of like jazz feeling they want to break shit apart and like mm. fuck around with stuff but you know yeah. and how, how, how did you get the gig? through Troy actually so Troy I used to play with Troy with um, the drummer? yeah Troy Troy the drummer he used to play with Amy Winehouse and with a guy called Soweto Kinch okay. we used to play with so I played with Soweto for like five years and in fact my first ever gig with Soweto was at um, Glastonbury Festival <laughs> on, on the it's called, I think it's called the West Holt stage now right. actually and and I was I remember getting the, I was doing some weird random theatre gig <laughs> and it's like phenomenal bass player back in London called uh, Mike Yanish he taught me, basically taught me how to play. Yeah, and right. he was like, Carl, man, um, 
at the moment there was a bit of management problems with things that man I don't want to deal with these people because like, you want to do this gig I was like what gig I was like oh I know Sue. I used to listen to him and I was like oh, do you want to just like do this gig man like where is it Glastonbury I was like uh, so hot started going <laughs> you mean okay. the, the tone or the festival, yeah, the festival. <laughs> yeah. I was like uh, okay I'll go, I'll go ahead whatever man and then so I got there to the rehearsal space and it was in this place in East London um, premises studio and Femi the guitar player Femi Tomo who's another phenomenal guitar player and like singer and arranger and blah 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 and he was there so it was there so Carl here's the music and this food is like sheets in front of me I was like okay <laughs> and then but I was like where's the drummer what's the drummer it's like, oh Troy can't make it oh. so I did this so I was in this rehearsal playing these songs playing along to them and they're not they're not like Easy, easy tracks. Not predictable, no, yeah, 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 yeah. And was it dots or was it just chords? Uh, some dots and some chords and okay. stuff like that. So it was a little bit. It's cool. But then I went home and practiced it. But then it, and it, I think the gig was like in less than a week. So I had to like hunker down and do it. And then um, got into the got into this got to the stage. And the first time I saw Troy because he wasn't even with us in the car. I think was on the stage. <laughs> it was like oh hi. <laughs> And so we've got this big stage, the West Holt stage, and like in the middle, there's Troy for the first time, there's Femi, and then go! And it's like a, an intense gig. Twitter's gigs are always quite intense from the get-go. And I was like, I couldn't, I, I, every, and every time I looked up, the crowd got bigger. I was like, oh no, okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> ah. You know, but it was like, what they call, they call it like trial by fire, basically. And I managed to just how, how I, how I inside there and survive the survive the fire and come out with quite a few burns yeah but, right. you know but I've like patched myself up and got stronger out of it to be honest and I love those situations really because that's when you really learn and you know what you need to work on sure. after you come out of yeah. those situations you know so I recommend anybody to put themselves in a situation where you feel really just uncomfortable yes. <laughs> yeah just say yeah sometimes you know pull Jim Carrey you know <laughs> you're a yes man you know. and was that was that kind of your introduction and schooling in that style of music that kind of Afro beat vibe or had you checked that stuff out in the, the past? The, the Afro beat stuff is from um, it's his little like, name drop is that because my mum my mom's one of my mum's best friend is Fella's one of Fella's daughters so I we when I was really young one of my first ever gigs that I went to that were quite big it was in the like London Astoria when I used to be around was Femi Femi Kuti playing. So that was my first introduction to like Afrobeat and I didn't even know what it was. In. But my first introduction to like improvised music was a John Lee, Lee Hooker Blues okay. CD. And that's my first like, I was like, what is this? Oh my God. And it, there were these packs where you can get like a blues, different blues um, artists every like month. Like, yeah. you know, I used to get like different bones. Like, like, yeah, 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 yeah. And it was like John Lee Hooker. And I was like, what is this? I can't remember any of this song, but I just remember the feeling of that kind of like raw soul and energy and like freedom and this like, the, yeah. his kind of husky voice and the raw cutting sound of the guitar and everything like and the groove. I was like, what is this? And I was really young at the time. I just used to play it play over again and stuff like that. And then, then later on down the line, because then I used to play trombone for the... Um, for, used to do this thing called Saturday School Morley College and used to go CYM and the school sorted me out and used to make trombone inside it used to quite a lot of classical music that's how I can read music and stuff okay. like that and have a little bit of like theory and then um, I got pulled into this jazz band and I was like what the hell is that and it was my friend playing uh, bass like uh -huh. Dan Dan who taught me how to play bass as well Dan uh, Guilano I don't know how to say it probably sorry <laughs> Dan, if you're watching this uh, and then I started playing bass from that and then I used to be, I'm a bit weird child, so I used to, <laughs> I used to print out, I printed out like the fretboard okay. on a piece of paper and just used to like, put, 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 like move our fingers around it. Put it under the string. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put, yeah just put, I'm like, but I didn't have a bass. I didn't have a bass at the time. Oh, yeah. This is you playing a paper. Paper, I was playing paper because I wanted to play bass so badly and we couldn't afford it but then my mum saved off a bit of money and she bought me like this five string bass, this Samic bass, like, oh, wow. it sounded like a piece of shit. Yeah sounded horrible and I put really light strings on because I thought I can't play yet so I need like Wait. really really light strings and it sounded so horrible but I've still got it to this day and I might take it out and tweak it a little bit um, and then that's that was my introduction to jazz and then he showed me Jaco and then oh I don't know why the first ever bass player that I heard was Jaco and then and then what's funny is good place I, to start yeah oh it's yeah, it's it's a good place to start but you have to go all the way back you have to go back. So I've been for the past 
like seven, well, how long have I been, I've been playing bass for like 10 years now. Okay. So I've been going back and back and back and back and back in time, like to, to, to where the, the foundation of like kind of bass started. Because I used to play these Jacko lines, but they wouldn't have any like groove to them. Mm. So like the... But it's like... Yeah. So, but it wouldn't, I'd just be playing like the line, the dots instead of like the groove behind it and stuff like that. So going more and more back. So then it was like, I checked out a lot of, uh, Paul, like, not Paul, Jack well, Paul Jackson's one of my, from the Herbie Hancock. Yeah, band, Paul, Paul Chambers. Chambers. Checked Paul Chambers and I went even further back to Ray Brown with the, with the Oscar people. Yeah. Then I went further back <clears throat> to um, Oscar Pettiford. So, you know, so it's checking those, Checking out the linear, they can get more further and back, so you have even more stronger foundation to mm. the raw essentials of what bass does. Because people who just start with Jaco, they don't understand where he came from. He's he's one of his favorite basses, was like Ray Brown. There's a famous photo of like Ray Brown playing like his bass. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and also Jaco was an R an R and B guy. Really. Yeah, he was, wasn't he? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Old school. Um, he used to tour around, didn't he? Playing with lots of oh, I remember. Wayne Cochran, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kind of stuff, yeah, 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 yeah. So when you when you you're checking out like you know Ray Brown and Paul James and stuff, are you listening, transcribing, playing, jamming along, or more just just absorbing it sonically? Um, <clears throat> but both, but more 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 than anything else, I try to get the vibe of what they're playing, okay, and their their kind of concept and stuff like that. And then I'll, I'll sometimes transcribe if I hear something that I really like then I'll definitely transcribe it and stuff like yeah. that. I'll try it. But I'm not I'm not the most methodical like transcribers than some yeah. other people that I know. I just listen to a lot of things, just try it. If I can sing along to something as well, then, then I'm kind of I think I've kind of If you can it. sing it you can probably yeah, yeah, yeah. play it. Yeah. So that's that's more my kind of thing. And I just listen to people as much as possible and just try um get them it's like listening to an accent basically the more you listen to an accent and you try and like copy it more and more you mm -hmm. get you kind of get to their kind of headspace and you understand their concept and it's and i had that most with ron carter actually with the when when he played with the miles davis band because some of the stuff that he does is um it's not he play will play like the bass line but it's his concept and his approach to playing within the band and how he sets them up and how he leads them to a certain direction and stuff like that more than anything else is what I learned from listening to uh, okay. for, for Ron yeah. Carter and stuff like that. More less than his bass lines. Yeah. Because I, I got that book, that um, that yellow and red book, and I played along to his bass lines. I thought, these, these are pretty, you know, standard. But it's when I listen to him in the context of the band and how we'd feed off of people, how I would push them in a certain direction, how we'd lose, like, pedal notes mm. and how we'd move around the pedal notes and stuff like that. And I'd be like, okay, I'm definitely going to take some of that and yeah. use some of those kind yeah. of energies and stuff. So, so how, how old were you when you started playing bass? Um, 16. Okay. So 16. And then I, for two years I played, played around. In 18, I wanted to go to Berkeley. And then I met Mike and Mike said, man, if you're going to play jazz, you're going to have to play double bass. Mm. So then I started shedding like a madman with double bass oh, really? and stuff like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you you did want to play jazz? You were like yeah, I was a, I was a jazz total jazz head. Yeah. I was like jazz, 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 jazz. <laughs> like you know, just like everything's jazz. And like oh, you listen to pop music. What is that? What's that? That's not that's not complicated. That's not that doesn't have like crazy weird changes. It you know yeah. too many right notes. I was such a jazz head. Oh my god. Um, uh, yeah, it was. But then you obviously come out of it. But that time I think it was quite important to go for those those things where you get have such tunnel vision and you're in like a place where you, nothing yeah. really matters and you're just obsessed with this kind of music and you put the, the, put the work in and yeah 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 so yeah. did you go and study yeah i went to study at berkeley for a year in the states yeah in the states yeah, well. yeah it was amazing i got a little scholarship to go there and i met some amazing people i'll bet uh so after what like four years of playing bass yeah 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah but i had i had i had i was so fortunate to be around some incredible players hmm who pushed me, told me what I needed to practice. And then like, Mike Yanish was one of the biggest guys. He just told me, right, this is what you need to do to become like a really competent bass player. And he told me what books to check out. And it just gave me certain things to practice. Like he would say, play your blues in different tempos in all 12 keys. Mm -hmm. So he'll put, he'll, what you would do as well, he would put like the, uh, the metronome on the slowest setting. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> this is in like lessons. And he said, all right, cool, play. 
playing blues in all 12 keys now and it will probably take me like 15 or 20 minutes and stuff like that yeah but as long as your intonation was like really on it and it will strengthen up your hands because people playing double bass is really slow you just feel it like yeah <laughs> and especially when you get to like d flat you have no you have no open strings anymore do you no so you're like, you're like <laughs> your hand is like so my hand got really strong so what like even to this day when i like like Pat people on the back or anything like you got really heavy hand. Oh, I'm sorry, man. I'm a bass player. Sorry, man. It's my D flat. Yeah, yeah. It's D flat. It's my D flat hand. You know. Uh, but um, so, what was Berkeley like? Intense. Yeah. Who's intense. your Who's your tutor? Um, John Lockwood. Like John Lockwood is a tutor, and we didn't. He didn't. We didn't really teach me. He kind of. We just kind of had plays. We'd be like, oh, I learned the standard for next week. We we'll just play along with it. And we just did that and stuff okay. like that. And it was more of a play. Because he knew, I think he knew that I was... On the right path. Yeah, he knew that I was just playing with loads of different people. And I just made a conscious effort because it costs... I mean, I got this scholarship, but the living cost out there is just just crazy expensive anyway. Yeah, right. cause I, so I thought, all right, my mum's spending a lot of money for me to be out here. So I'm going to make the most of it. And I did make the most of it. And I made it to get some really, met some really, really nice people met this Alex Hahn who plays with Marcus Miller actually he's really incredibly scary talented like saxophone player um, I met this I met another guy called Dan uh, oh, Dan 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 he plays, he plays with Imagine Dragons now oh cool yeah he's a superstar but he's an incredibly talented like drummer he's got perfect pitch he can like play violin and viola and stuff like that he plays, he plays a little bit of saxophone as well um and in fact, from that, that was my first ever tour. We went to Japan, it's like a few weeks. Who with? Uh, with the, some of the guys from Berkeley. Okay. With Dan Platzman, that's his name. Yeah. Dan Platzman. And so he, he got me in the group to tour to Japan a little while. We had a great time out there. Was that jazz stuff? Or? Yeah, jazz stuff. We were playing some cold train tunes and stuff like that. It was okay. a lot of fun. I got roasted quite a bit, like, <laughs> got my house kicked. But that's, <laughs> that's just the way it is, you know, when you're learning. Yeah. Um, then I came back and then I started gigging with Soweto as soon as I came back and stuff like that. And that lasted for around four or five years. So that's, that's when you got the glass and brief, that's now. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's where you met Troy. Troy. And then after that, I played with Jason Rabello for a while, which is an amazing experience. So he, he disappeared for a while playing with like Sting and stuff mm. like that. And then he came <laughs> back with like an incredibly intense jazz album, like kind of funk album. Uh, and then I played with Courtney Pine as well, which is an amazing experience. Yeah, cool. Well, it's, it's like in in Courtney Pine's band, my role was just straight up bass. You, you, you're because he's such a lead guy, like mm. incredible. You just you have to lay down the foundation and stuff like that. Uh, and then now I'm playing with Laura. Yeah. And now I'm mostly I'm concentrating on just fighting my own kind of music as much as possible, really. Yeah. Yeah. Then. Like, doing beat takes, doing some kind of spoken word stuff a little bit, kind of rapping, whatever you want to call it, but like, you know, get into that world, different kind of world. Have, yeah. have you learned a lot of that, about that kind of stuff from working with, with Laura and stuff? Uh, in terms of songwriting, yes. Yeah. In terms of songwriting and approaching a song, trying to get the emotional value out of a song, definitely from Laura. In terms of rapping, I like coming a bit kind of beats is definitely from um, Soweto and, and he's, uh, Getting a storyline out of something, definitely Soweto. Right. Because he, his songs are always like, he's always story based. And I, and I really enjoyed that when I used to work with him. He always have a clear narrative and yeah. stuff like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. If you could go back in time and, you know, give yourself 16 year old Carl a bit of advice, what, what would you say to him to help you where you are now? Trust yourself even more, take more risks. Right. And don't, don't, don't worry about, don't, don't listen to other people, but trust yourself more than anything else. And don't, and don't obsess about uh, money too much, mm. more than anything else. Because I came from a background where I didn't have money. Mm -hmm. But, and slowly, slowly when I, you start getting older and you make a little bit, you realise it's, it's important, but it's not the, it's not the be all and end all of everything at all. Because I've had, I've had certain people like pass away and money, you're not gonna get, you can't bring them back with money or anything like that. You're just gone. So like cherish your friends, mm. hang out with your friends as much as possible and cherish that time with your friends because you don't know how, how long they're gonna be there. And you know, and if, if they look like they need some help, ask them if you need any help, man, you know, talk to them, be honest and be open with them because mm. 
some people are hurting and you don't you don't know mm. and sometimes they just want somebody to be like are you okay yeah for sure and you know and it means a lot because everybody's been through some damn times you know but sometimes people don't see the light at the end of the tunnel at all and yeah. so it leads to a certain situation which is incredibly sad uh, yeah. so that's what I would say trust yourself don't obsess about money and hang out with your friends as much as possible and be there when you need them when they need you and stuff like that and great. stuff like that yeah, yeah, yeah. great advice yeah. Um, and how, how do you view yourself as a player now compared to you know, your Berkeley days and stuff Berkeley like days, I'm, I'm le less obsessed about technique, uh, less obsessed about like showing off, yeah. I'm more obsessed about supporting the song as much as possible and getting the, uh, getting, getting the, the raw song, the overall sound of everything to come across as much as possible within the band and knowing my role and how I can support the singer, the soloist, or wherever it is that I'm backing up and supporting them as much as possible yeah. to make the thing sound fucking good as possible. And is, yeah. does that encompass like tone and, and sonics and stuff yeah, as well? Yeah, definitely. Because some, uh, some songs need uh, uh, things to punch out a little bit more. But mostly, mm. I mean, there's some songs, but most they want people the way here, they're based, they want the bass like kind of like, kind of subby. Yeah, right, the, yeah. They want the most... They wanted to be meaty more yeah. than anything else. And when I first started playing, I didn't have that meat at all. I used to, I didn't even, it wasn't, there wasn't, I don't know how I used to play, but there wasn't any like fatness behind yeah, it right. at all. Yeah. And you were playing P bass generally? Oh no, I used to play like a jazz bass, like a jazz cheap bass. jazz bass. Yeah. And then I got, I've also re, re, only recently got into like P basses and their sound and stuff like it's, that. It's, recording. It's, it's the bass player evolution. Like I was always like a kind of, jazz bass kind of guy yeah. and then eventually you kind of grow into mm. a, a, a P bass it's kind yeah, of like yeah. you reach that musical maturity in yeah way, definitely where you because you realise the the power and the importance of the P bass mm -hmm. in, in the music because it makes you play in a certain way like what you're saying mm. like trying to play those lines sometimes you can't do it so so you don't do it yeah yeah you know it simplifies it but also um, it just has that that pillow of sound, sound yeah, 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 that you yeah, can't really get with yeah. any other kind of mm. pickup. Yeah, yeah. So it's in, it's interesting that we all eventually kind of come around to the way of the P bass. That's definitely, man. Especially, I mean, all the best bass players in the world have a P bass anyway, man. It's like you have James Jameson, which is the king of all kings of bass players, and like from the get go, and you have Pino, yeah, one of the kings, and um, even Larry Graham as well. Was Larry Graham a P bass guy? From the get-go? Potentially. Maybe. I don't know. Or we'll say he did, anyway. <laughs> to make my story seem valid. Did you, did uh, you check out a bunch of the, the Jameson stuff? Like the Motown book? Yeah. I didn't check yeah. out the book, but I, I, what I used to do when I used to... Um, when I was... When I started... I wanted to learn how to learn music really quickly. So I used to uh, put on... My mum had this like, Motown like CD and I will put on the record, listen to it once, try to play along with it. Yep. And then be like, right, I know the song now. And try to play along with it again. And then note play along with all the chores and stuff like that, learning as quickly as possible. Okay. So I'll just give myself once to learn it and then play it again and see how much I would so remember. That's like stuff pretty like that. good training for, for now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but now, I mean, like, it, it'd be, if, we're only, if we need to learn a song quickly for like an arrangement or like a little cover, then I'll be able to learn it really quickly. Mm. Or even if I get into certain gigs and I, I'll be like, oh, okay, I know I have to play the song really yeah. quickly now. So that, you know, you can, you can break it down into your head. You sure. need to simplify the song. Oh, this song is exactly the same as this part or this, the other part and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, I used to do weird things like that. I used to wake up in the middle of the night and like um, just play with my eyes closed so I can play on the bass with like, like looking at this, like using, using your ears. <laughs> Yeah. So you're using your ears more than you're looking at your 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 hands more yeah, than anything yeah. else, you know. So, <laughs> but you used to wake up in the middle of the night. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. yeah. this is a bit obsessive sure. and a bit weird, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> but well, I mean, what are you gonna do when you're like a uh, like sixteen year old or seven, eighteen? You're just like. Wake up in the middle of the night, everybody's kind of, you know, two o'clock in the morning, you can't get to sleep. You can either do your homework or you can play bass. <laughs> I think I'll play bass a little bit and stuff like that, you know. Well, it's, it's certainly paid off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hope it has anyway. Yeah. Um, like, and watching the gig last night as well, just thinking, you've got a couple of different 
sounds and stuff happening down there? You got a little pedal board happening? Yeah, or? so that that's a Mark Bass uh, synth thing, which is actually the tr- the tracking on that is really good. But what I what I've done is I um because I've got into like um synthesizing stuff because I've got into like production and stuff sure. like that and. Uh, I went into so with the mark based thing you can actually hook it up to your um, computer via USB and then like it opens, it has its own like um, program where you can mess around with the settings and create okay. your own programs or settings or presets. Yeah. And so I went in there and I made a p- specific kind of preset to sound it, make it sound like the uh, um, Dave Swift Pro Two, and so like a little cut off point you can adjust the two octaves, get one octave down there. But the only sad thing about it, it only does one waveform, which is like a sawtooth waveform so oh, okay. that's the only bad thing about it but um but it's very it's quite versatile and, it's quite, and so with each with each sound there's like nine different synth sounds and you get different presets within the sure. thing and in one with each and within a nine sound you get one bank with your own uh your own your user own set user setting and yeah. i know you're pretty bold with how low you go in terms of using octave down? Like oh you, yeah, yeah, like yeah, you're, yeah. Going, you're going below the range of a five string. Like you're yeah, using yeah, yeah, AG. yeah. It tracks that. Yeah, yeah, it tracks that pretty well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It does pretty well. And also because I've got, I've got like um, a really good the amp that I'm using the TH five hundred on yeah. the Aguilar and also the four the four ten for tonight. Yeah. yeah, but usually I like weird sound. Like weird sound. I like the two twelve. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, there's one I've got. The one I've the Aglo I, I got from Aglo is a two twelve DB two. Yeah, DB two. Yeah, two twelve. Yeah, right. Because it's a bit more bigger, so you get yeah. even more bottom end and stuff like that. You know. Okay. So, but not as much cone surface area as a four ten. No, like but I just want the bottom end, man. I just want, <laughs> I just want bass. I yeah. just want, I want to be like a like a uh, Aston Family man, Barrett man. Just raw. Just, just trouser flat. Yeah, that's what I want, man. <laughs> And for the, and for her gig as well, because she likes that kind of sub. Yeah. She comes from a bit of a Caribbean background, so she has here's that slight like, sub okay. kind of thing yeah, inside of her as well. You know? So it's yeah. just a just a mark base. Super, mark base, and it has and it has like an octave and the synth thing. Yep. So I had to switch between the both 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 of them and stuff like that. You know. Yeah. So, but then at home I've got other pedals as well that have like the OC two that you've got here. Classic. And um, uh, some distortion pedals. I had like an MX uh, uh, MXR Distortion Plus. Yep. And then I have a DD5, this digital delay. Boss, yeah, yeah, delay. And then Do I, you find much use for the delay? Um, no. <laughs> no, it's not I know, really. I know what you mean, yeah. It's yeah. always like one of those things you think, oh, maybe maybe get a little bit of reverb or delay yeah. happening, and then you take it to the gig and... It is. I mean, I've, I've, I had this. So hard to make it work. You, you could, I, I made it work once <laughs> for like two seconds <laughs> when, during the gig. Uh, when because I had this band called like Thousand Kings with, with like a phenomenal saxophone player and the drummer, and uh, there'll be a little weird. We we like to make we like to build up the sound first of all before we get into like a groove or anything like that. Okay. And the dig they work perfectly there. <laughs> just yeah. like weird noises. Like atmospheric. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like put the feedback all the way to like one hundred and let it just. <laughs> nearly blow up my amp for whatever it is yeah. you know uh, other than that it's really hard to use it like effectively you know um, maybe I'm just not that uh, cool enough or <laughs> to find a way but I think there is the, there must be a way to like get it within a groove to make it sound like really nice as well probably yeah I think that probably the hard thing would just be syncing it up to be yeah. the right time the tap to you left to get like a tap tempo in, yeah. or, or maybe if there was a way to get some kind of midi sync towards it and everybody's playing along and everybody's on I think like, maybe the um, the line 6 d- digital delay yeah I think, that, I think you can midi sync that Oh, but it's like that size yeah you know, it oh. takes up so much space on your board yeah, for yeah. One song or you know one song yeah. a year, <laughs> yeah, or like yeah. Uh, for, for a lifetime. You know he's going to use that kind of like digital lane. Yeah, the song, you know. and you you were saying earlier on um, uh, about Pino, yeah, being a, being an influence, and obviously Michelle, I mean, Michelle, Michelle yeah, yeah. Maybe talk a little bit about what how they've impacted on you as as a bass player. Um, just they just teach me how to how to in the contemporary setting mm. they're put, probably the most like influential for me. I mean everybody said the D, the D'Angelo video album, like yep. that's this. <laughs> <coughs> it's like um, the epitome of bass playing from the in terms of like because the Jay Diller stuff because that's what it's kind of they yep. got a lot of influence from that. But hearing it in like a live setting is amazing. But in terms of Michelle, it's just the lines that she comes up with, man. Mm. They're incredibly musical. Oh, I'm trying to think of. Um, uh, he's just 
like the that, most funkiest bass player you ever heard. Yeah, yeah. Thing, <laughs> He's just, he's just funky. Oh, yeah. And it, it, I like the faces that she makes as well. She's playing, she's so into it, you know. It's a full um, body experience. And not even that, she's an incredible songwriter as well. Yeah, and singer. Yeah, so, like, so, what more could you want, really, yeah. you know? I think she even wanted to work with Laura, actually, you know, but things obviously didn't quite pan you, out. You go down there. And, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, we've, really got, we've really got a bit. Yeah, Alonzo, like, oh, we've got Carl. You know about Carl? <laughs> No, no. Um, but she's an incredible songwriter, incredible bass player. And then she, uh, did, you, uh, did you ever hear the pod- pro- project when she did with Chris, uh, Chris Daddy Dave, where she's not really singing at all? She's just like playing bass and just laying down the no. fastest grooves you ever heard. Yeah. A spirit, the Spirit Music Jemima or something like that. Is that her album or his it's, album? No, it's her album. Oh, okay. And it's just like pure, pure instrumentals and she's just playing bass like an absolute beast. Wow. And then she did, I remember this one, she did a cover of um, a Radiohead, you know that? Uh, 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 but yeah. she just funks it up with like horns and stuff like that. I think I might have heard that yeah, one. Have yeah, you yeah. heard the, there's um, an Earth, Wind and Fire tribute album and like Shaka Khan's on it. Okay. And Michelle does a track on it. Oh, what track, well. what track does she do? Um, I feel like it's fantasy. Okay. But it's that kind of like grindy garage rock yeah, yeah, yeah. vibe on it. Yeah, it's just because she she spans that you know almost acid jazz funk mm. thing to garage rock yeah. to you know beat poet to just yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> she, yeah she does do poetry as well, doesn't she? Yeah, the kind of spoken word stuff yeah. and the go go flex as well. Yeah, she's incredibly talented, man. Yeah, man. And meeting her is like far out as well. She's like she's in her own world. She's just like. Oh yeah, yeah. She's. Oh, you met her? Yeah, 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 yeah. I met her like I met her in. She came to do a gig at Ronnie Scott's. I met her. I met her when I was traveling around with Soweto. I also met her when I was doing a gig with Courtney Pine in Israel. So she, she like and she she respects Courtney Pine a lot. She was like, oh man, love you to meet Courtney Pine. Cool. You know? Yeah. So and you're like, like, hey, I'm playing yeah, the baseball. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> and I so I so badly wanted to get a photo with her. But did you I, know she was there? I didn't. I I think I knew I was. She was there. I was like, I got a bit excited because I wanted to see her. But we were playing at the same time. I think. Okay. With, oh, I was playing with Courtney Pine. Um. But yeah, she's this. Yeah. Bit yeah. Off, yeah. But I'd have, uh, I'm trying to think. What my favorite album is. Uh, God. God, yes, yeah, no. no, uh, uh, Plantation Lullaby is an amazing album, yep. but then I came, uh, uh, Lady something, no, I can't remember now. <laughs> Cookie Anthology is another really good one. Uh, I know, no. yeah, 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 it's all good anyway. They're That's cool. Amazing. Um, what's next for me, yeah. Um, write my own music. I was going to bring you some of the stuff that I... Uh, Tended to me or link yeah, yeah, to me or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll put yeah. it up. I'm just writing my stuff because I yeah. fell in love with Ableton, basically. Okay. Because uh, I have a friend whose name is uh, Quake Bass and he's like a, he's a, he's like a midi nut. Okay. He's like... <laughs> He's a crazy dude, right? <laughs> but like if, if you meet him, but he's he's so, he's like full of passion and love, and he just loves what he does, and he's like he makes any situation he's in, is he creates a nice vibe, yeah, and he's an honest guy and stuff like that. But he's like a he loves midi, he loves midi, he's a midi nut, and he's like <laughs> he, he's like he wants everything to be like almost like a Borg, all these wants all these pedals and everything to work perfectly together yeah. and sync and stuff like that. But he's a drummer, he's an amazing drummer. Okay. Um, he used to play, he plays with like MF Doom, all these other like hip hop cats and he's all yeah. he's currently on tour with like a girl called Kate Tempest who's a he's a scary talented lady like mm. if you can check her out um all from South London as well so we're up in South London taking over the world a bit like it you know uh and then so yeah yes yeah, but he told me to get I was like oh what should I do what, what should, I want to get into like producing and writing my stuff he said Carl Ableton Ableton man yeah. Ableton Ableton but it's funny because my experience with Ableton was playing with Soweto and we, there was always be a problem when he used it live because he used to use it with like switchboards and stuff like that and things either things wouldn't come in at the same time or things would overlap or things just uh right. just just 
fuck up in some way or yeah, another. Yeah. And so our, we used to make our Ableton dead. Because <laughs> so, it's called Ableton Live. Ableton, <laughs> Ableton dead, man. <laughs> Ableton dead. But, uh, and is your music, are you basically kind of putting the bass aside and it's all electronic? Um, or yeah, not all electronic. electronic. I'm, like, I'm, I, I find myself like bringing the bass to live, live instruments because that's the way I've kind of, I've tried to be fully electronic to uh, try to be a bit of like an Aphex, but that's not me really. And it's yeah, been yeah. a process of finding who I am for these past like two years. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's, it's starting all over again, really. Yeah. But you're not at the same time because you have a certain foundation of like harmony and like songs a little bit and stuff like that. But finding so out who you are together and yeah, channeling yeah, it into one thing. Yeah, into, into one thing that is really strong and you feel happy with and you feel comfortable with. Because I did a gig ages ago in November, like two years ago, November, where I, just, I became myself with Bonnie Ver because I thought that was the most beautiful music I've ever heard in my life. And it is incredibly beautiful now, like wrote these songs and some of them were really good and I got some good feedback. But... Um, I realised that I need to work on my voice incredibly a lot more. Mm. And it wasn't really me, me, me. It was just one, one uh, section of me yeah. that I kind of wanted that to explore. That you kind of work out. And yeah, yeah. That becomes part and of so it. And so now I'm tapestry. in this kind of hip hop thing where I'm writing loads and loads of beats every day, like mm. getting like, my like Jay Dillo or like... Do you have stuff with you on the road to, to work on? Yeah, I've got my laptop with me, yeah. like Ableton, Ableton Live. Yeah. And when I'm running it uh, and then... Uh, just doing that, writing as much as him. But then now I'm thinking, right, I've got to write songs. It's all good, like, just writing beats. Yeah. You've got to write the songs with the beats and stuff like that. So I've been trying to, like, one of my favourite producers is, of, is, like, Kanye and Pharrell and stuff like that. So I'm thinking, how can I get these melodies with these kind of soul, either soul beats, or these kind of kind of weird esoteric beats sometimes, mm. like kind of industrial. How can I bring melody and song into this kind of situation? And... I, I went through a thing listening. Have you heard of Peter Gabriel's Soul? So, so, so album. Yeah. Like that album with Daniel Lanois so as amazing. well. Yeah. yeah, that, he's one of my other favourite producers. I'm like, I've got this kind of rock thing inside of me and in this hip hop, I'm like, okay. Yeah. Especially as, if you're a session bass player, you need to be able to be incredibly Switch, versatile. Yeah. So it's almost like a, um, it's a curse at the same time that you can be, you can take all these, you can hear a sound and break it apart and see how it functions and how oh, I can replicate it mm -hmm. at the same time. But you, you, to be like an artist, you've got to be like, right, this is my thing I'm going to craft. Mm -hmm. And, but I'm still, still in a bit of a um, session, but session headspace where I hear things and break them apart and put them back together again. And I'm tr trying my hardest to almost step away from that and try to make stuff that is purely visceral. From you. Just yeah, for my own character, my own self. Yeah. And it's taken, it's taken its time. I've gone through down times and up times with it, but I'm trying to just be positive about it and keep working towards yeah. it and working hard. And I know stuff is going to come out of it and sure. I've got some good feedback from different people and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, cool, man. So I'd just rather be positive about it as much as possible yeah. and just keep them pushing and pushing and pushing yeah. one way or another. I just need to do more gigs to realise what works and what doesn't work yeah. more than anything else, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So just playing with Laura, doing your own stuff, and doing my own stuff. Just ride, ride it. Right. Right. Yeah. Just. I mean, what can you do in this life? Yeah. Other than just kind of ride the wave, and if you don't have a clear, clear vision of what you're doing, then I'd rather just ride, ride the wave as much as possible, and take what comes, and like learn as much as possible as I sure. can. Just That's be my, that sponge. Yeah. It's, just take it all in, and then throw it into the mix. Work, craft it. <laughs> <laughs> like it's like a sculpture. Yeah. Take that out. Blah 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 blah. Ah, oh, I kind of like that sculpture, but that's not quite what I'm going for. And then keep on, you know, Definitely. you know, if I yeah. do a bit of a Picasso, really, and then because he that kind of late Picasso, because I mean, he loved African art, but right. he came at it from his own kind of perspective, you know, and like twisted it around. Yeah. So that's I'm, I'm in like that kind of phase. I awesome think, man. Like and that. if people want to. Connect with you, check out your stuff. Where, where can they find you on, on Carl, Carl, Carl with a K, Rashid Abel, R A S H E E D A B E L, and then dot com. You dot com, and I'm, I'm on Twitter. I'm, a, I'm not big Twitter head really, but um, I'm on Instagram. I don't follow people on Instagram because I've got, as you can might realize, I'm a bit obsessive. <laughs> so if I go on Instagram, I'm just, but I, 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 I'm on Facebook as well and stuff like that. Yeah. And it, um, but and we think music is <coughs> on SoundCloud or Bandcamp. Or yeah, I'm on I'm on Bandcamp as well. You can like, listen down my little beat tape on Bandcamp yeah, cool. and on SoundCloud. I I put put random stuff on on SoundCloud and stuff like that as yeah. well. So you can check that out as well. Yeah. Cool man. Wicked. Wow. Carl Rashid, everybody.
Yeah. Nice one. Guys, yes. thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Um, we'll see you next time. Bless.